Uh, first of all, welcome. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to listen to my rant. Um, hopefully, it will be a fun session. Um, I titled it Safe and Signed Git Commits with PGP. It's like a word play on safe and sound. You get it, right? So this is something we started. I was working for a large telecom provider in Norway. Uh, they wanted us to, to explore signing of the Git commits because they were coming, consultants were coming and going from the project all the time, and they were like, well, we'd really like to be sure that the commits are from people that are actually on the, on the project. <clears throat> and I thought, well, GitHub will surely make sure that the, the person is correct. But it uh, turns out it's pretty easy to fake that. So um, well, we uh, went looking for solutions. And we found uh, that PGP was easily supported. So we went in with there. So first of all, a little bit about me. I'm uh, Thomas. Hi. I work for Tieto Every. It's a consultancy in the Nordics. And we're spread out over, I guess, 20 countries. Um, uh, so uh, I'm a, I've become kind of quite a grumpy old man, you know, frequently yelling at clouds and frequently sticking my nose where it doesn't belong. So uh, that's why I made this call, uh, this talk. Sorry. So I work at uh, Tieto Every, as I said. Um, we are 27,000 people, I think. So we're spread out all, all over. And we're, everyone is basically doing their own things. And it's not a lot of co cooperation uh, like uh, between the different projects. But uh, that's OK. So they have graciously sponsored me to go to this uh, conference and other conferences this fall. And also, I should mention, we're hiring, of course. So I love all things open source, uh, and I'm an eager, eager advocate for open source. So this is my kind of my 10% project that I do, uh, besides being a mobile developer during the day. Um, trying to raise awareness about how we should uh, sustainably consume and contribute back to open source, and also how we should create our own open source and inner source. So. Um, I basically love everything that runs on electricity. So uh, that makes me purchase stuff from time to time that I probably shouldn't have. But uh, so I just want to gouge like the, the audience here. So who owns no Raspberry Pis? Who don't know what, what a Raspberry Pi is and how none of them? There are no hands up. Who has one Raspberry Pi? There are some hands. Who has two and three? <laughs> there we go. Four? OK. Five, then? No one with five. So I think I'm at three or something right now, so right in the middle there. The Raspberry Pis are beautiful. I, I don't really use them for anything, but they're so cool, so I just need to have them around. So that's fun. Well, enough about me. Yeah, well, you can contact me. I should mention that if you like, if you have any questions after this. Uh, we'll, of course, do a Q&A at the end if I have time. I haven't really uh, practiced or rehearsed the timing here, so we'll see how much time I spend. But I will get cues from the back when it's, uh, when it's over. It's time out. So we'll see. So this is uh, the thing I, uh, I want to talk about. Um, we'll do a, like a very light version about cryptography, because I guess not everyone are hardcore developers, uh, but might need to know something about how cryptography works. So we'll do just no deep dive at all, just over the covers, above the covers. Look at a little bit about how pretty good privacy, which is PGP, uh, how it came to be, and also later the uh, GNU Privacy Guard. There are some fun with acronyms. The open source communities love their acronyms. Uh, and we'll look, about, uh, look at a little bit how you can publish your keys and have other people sign them and vouch for your identity. And also, um, we could be using GPG for encrypting files and stuff like that. But I have left that part out uh, since I don't, I'm not sure that we'll get through everything. If we have time, I'll briefly pop by that. Let's see. So very, very, very short version of how cryptography works. You have a, let's see if I have a pointer here. There is a pointer, a laser pointer. You can see that? You can see that, yeah. So you have a, a plain text that you want to encrypt. You 
uh, use a key and you pass it through some algorithm, black box, don't know what it is, and out comes the ciphertext. So that's basically how it works. Uh, the reverse is the exact the same. You take the ciphertext and the same key and you pass it through the same algorithm and out comes the plain text. There we go. Um, so this, we can use this for a lot of things, as you know. So uh, we'll go through some of the concepts that make out, make up cryptography. And this is like, this is the symmetric one. So we'll do the asymmetric one uh, and compare them. So symmetric uh, encryption, uh, one of the standards are called AES. Not really important here. Uh, the other uh, is asymmetric. So the comparison would be that the symmetric uh, encryption is, uses the same key uh, for both encryption and decryption, and we can combine this. Um, asymmetric encryption uses uh, two keys. While you keep one private, you can publish the other one, and we can do some things with that. Um, and comparatively, uh, you use shorter keys for symmetric encryption because it's stronger. It's not really, can't really say that, but I'll do anyway for comparison. So with the, the RSA, the asymmetric encryption, you use longer keys then. Um, and as symmetric encryption is less computationally intensive, you will uh, use that for larger uh, batches of data. Uh, and you will use asymmetric encryption uh, and signing for smaller batches of data, like encrypting a symmetric key, like we'll see. Uh, so, in common for this, it's like key management is the hard part. For symmetric uh, encryption, it's, it's hard to distribute the key safely to someone you don't know because, well, you don't know them. Uh, with the asymmetric uh, encryption, it's you have your private key and you should keep that private forever, but if you don't, well, you're kind of screwed. So if someone gets hold of your uh, private key, they can use it to decrypt stuff that you have encrypted before. Not good. So, then a very, very uh, short version of how public key cryptography works. You generate a key pair on your computer, preferably. Uh, the private key should never leave it. There's the point. The private key should never leave your computer. You don't copy it, you don't move it anywhere, but you keep it safe. Then you can post your public key on your website or public key server for everyone to download. Uh, again, uh, your friends can verify, and you can uh, verify that it's really your key, and then they can download it and sign it. Um, how you verify that is part of the distribution problem. It's like, yeah, you can you can just call someone and say, hey, this is my key. You can can you please verify it? And if they do, they're well, they could be. They don't really know who they're talking to, right? So there, there, there's a there's a little bit of a of a problem there, but usually it, it works out well because you can usually verify someone. If there's someone you don't know, then, then it's not as easy. But uh, with friends, it's easier. So that's, that's the scope of the, the, this thing, is that we are using it inside of a team. So when you're we're working on a software project, you're using it inside of a team, so that makes it a whole lot easier because, well, you know the people on the team. So you can also make a, a certificate with that key and that holds your name and other details. And by signing that using your private key, it's provable that the certificate is authentic because, well, you signed it, so you're the only one who can do that. So that's the, that's the good thing about this. It's very easy to do. It requires no infrastructure at all. And then if someone wants to send you a message, uh, they'll, they'll download your public key. Um, they can see it's been signed by other people because, well, you're forming a web of trust as I'm signing Marno's key and Marno is signing someone else's key. I can implicitly trust them because I trust Marno, right? Marno is my friend right here. Hi. <laughs> I'll be using you a lot. <laughs> so, well, if you encrypt the message, uh, only your private key can decrypt it, basically. So, as I said, for larger data sets, you can, there's something wrong with the font there. I don't know. Something is skewed. <laughs> it doesn't show up here. Okay, well, uh, we, you can, you can um, 
use the uh, symmetric key to encrypt your data. So if you follow this, uh, this um, schematic, you have a, a piece of data that you'd like to encrypt, and it's a big piece of data, so uh, you then generate a random key, and you use a good pseudo number, uh, pseudo number ram, uh, random, pseudo random number generator, <laughs> PRNG, yeah. To do that, so you're sure that it doesn't contain any patterns and it's not uh, easily forged or breakable. So by using that random key, you encrypt the data uh, with this key, and then you also rec uh, encrypt the key with your private, uh, I mean, the receiver's uh, public key. You don't have their private key, right? But you can encrypt this symmetric key with their uh, public key, and then you can send the encrypted data and the encrypted key to them in an encrypted message. So the other side of the, the thing is that they take the encrypted message, they uh, apply their private key to the symmet uh, encrypted symmetric key, and thereby they getting the uh, symmetric key un uh, de decrypted, and then they can apply that uh, using the symmetric key algorithm to the message, and they get the plain text. So this is kind of best of both worlds, where you get the lighter encryption, uh, symmetric encryption for the large data set, and you also solve the, pr the problem of distributing the keys. So, um, any more points there? No, we're done. Okay, I, sh I was supposed to click through this as well. It just says the same thing that I've been saying now. Good. <laughs> so, there's another concept that uh, we could talk about for a little while. This uh, it's, a, it's a concept of a hash function. It's a one-way function. So as you can see, I, I'm uh, in this example, I'm doing uh, uh, echoing a hello world into to a SHA-256 sum tool. It returns a hash. And I do the same thing with almost the same message, but if you notice that the W is now a small one, it returns a completely different message. So any small change will completely change the hash, so it's impossible to guess what it is. Well, theoretically impossible. Uh, so what you can, okay, let's see. Return the same uh, ciphertext for any, any time you do this, you'll get the same hash, right? Any time you send the same message to the hash function, you will get the same hash back. So changing a single character completely changes it. Um, and there's no really any conventional way to return this. So, so reversing it, it doesn't really apply. Uh, but if you use a weak hash function, like a, what's it called, a 40-bit uh, DES? I, no, not DES. Anyway, like a weak hash will, of course, be susceptible to a brute force attack where you can try every single possible value and then guess the, the uh, original message from that. But the cool thing is a matching hash value. If you calculate the hash value again and it matches, it's proof that this message has not been altered. So that's what we're using for signing. Right. Quickly again, signing is the, how you do this is that you want to enable other people's, people to verify that message really came from you. So what you do is that you write a message and you calculate its hash value. Then you can, uh, with your private key, you can encrypt that hash value. And if it's possible to decrypt it with your public key, then they know that it came from you. If the hash doesn't match, it's been changed and it wasn't the original match uh, hash, so it, it's not from you. you can't be, and then it can't be trusted. So yeah, again, going through this a little bit quickly, but I guess it's, uh, it's something most people know but maybe no, don't think about. So it's, I guess it's okay to have a little repeating of it. So let's see. Yes, that's the last point. So this is what a public key looks like. I guess you have seen it before. Uh, my public key is, uh, base, is placed on Keybase. It's an online platform. It's open source, of course. And uh, well, it's uh, just a nice way to like publish uh, your keys, and it uh, has also has a lot of other functions. So you can go to Keybase IO and 
slash Angunis, which is, a, yes, it's a game character I made once upon a time. So that's just, just a name. But that's me, and you'll find it there, and you'll see the exact same key that I've listed here, I think. No, probably not. But this is how I, I, I show the key. Uh, the command is on top there. Use GPG and export it. And, uh, and it's connected to the mail address. You can have many, but yeah, let's not go in there. Um, pretty good privacy is a fun acronym. And it was uh, made in the 90s by a guy called Phil Zimmerman, <coughs> leveraging, well, cryptography and signing, hashing algorithms to encrypt and decrypt text and email and file and whole disks and whatever. And this software was made, or, or the, the, the protocol and how it works, it was made into an open PGP standard. So it's the RFC 4880. If anyone's interested in that, you'll find it on the internet. And I mentioned before, it's a web of trust model rather than the hierarchical models of certificates like we know from, from SSL or TLS uh, certificates. This is more based on I'm signing your key and you're signing my key and we're doing the web of trust. So uh, then later the Free Software Foundation created GPG, um, also based on the same thing because the original package was, uh, I guess, proprietary software by Symantec. So GP the Free Software Foundation wanted to have an open source version, so they did this. And uh, Werner Koch was the guy who did that. Um, same thing is used for, for uh, encrypting and decrypting. And I found that poor Werner almost went bankrupt doing this because he had no funding and he was like doing it in his spare time, but the popularity exploded. And yeah, we know these sad stories, they're all over the internet. So support your local open source guy. Um, quickly about GPG, installing it, it's not hard. <laughs> Whether your favorite package manager is uh, yeah, any of them. I guess GPG has been ported to every known platform known to man. So you just install it. Uh, I go brew, install GPG, and I'm done. It generates a, a, a key ring for you, and, and all the keys that you later generate there will be put into a database, and it's quite transparent once it's set up. Uh, you can export it, of course, and move it to your new computer if you like. And you can download other people's keys, and you can sign and do all that thing. So instead of now showing how it's done, I'm just going to skip that. So I hope, uh, uh, hope it's okay. So this part about uh, signing other people's keys, right? You need a way to verify that they are really who they say they are. So people have been arranging uh, key signing parties. So the top photo is basically what you think a key signing party looks like. And the bottom one is what it actually looks like bunch of guys with paper and this is my key, can you verify that? And here's my key, and yeah. So uh, it works, I guess. Uh, it doesn't really scale like globally. But um, I met a guy a few months back. His claim to fame, as he said, was that he had a PGP key from the 90s somewhere, somewhere signed by the original author of GPG. So that was like, yes, this is my thing. So just keeping your keys for that many years is kind of good, I think. So, yes, again, mentioning the web of trust because you can accumulate a lot of signatures over time. And uh, the more people who have signed your key, the more likely it's trustable. <clears throat> and so, well, again, the web of trust, it's, it's like I tried to explain earlier. Um, if you're Ingo and you trust Eva, then you can also trust uh, Manuel Stranger because Eva trusts him. You can trust that he is who he says he is, but you can't really trust that he has uh, good intentions, right? Um, but, uh, but, but the web of trust is built like that. So, oh, it says key signing party again. I thought we were done with that, my problem. Well, uh, within, a, within a team, like we did in, in the, the client uh, software, in the software team that we were working, we, 
we just signed each other's keys and we uploaded them to, to these key servers. There are several of them on the internet. You can choose which one you want to trust and you can upload your keys there. Uh, and I have a quick example also how a, another team did this. It's uh, Calcite, I guess. Uh, I don't know who they are, but we can trust them to at least, let's see now if we can just pick that up. Oh, I got a new version, that's nice. Yes, I would like to join. You can, no, you can't see this. Okay, so I'll try to, um, for a moment, just stop the um, presentation. And we're back, and we have issues to decode. And this file isn't formatted, uh, it's not highlighted as it should be, so never mind the coloring. But this team has like gathered all their keys, you can just list them up here uh, in one file. They upload that to their uh, website and everyone, anyone who needs to verify all the keys for all the teams and the people in the team can download that file and see their, their thumbprints and the full keys as well. And this can of course be, uh, be uh, uh, machine read and you can import this into your keyring and you can sign everyone's keys once you verify them and so on. It's, uh, it works pretty well, I guess. Uh, so when people leave the team, you remove their key and basically everything they've signed before will still be signed by them, but the key won't be, be uh, uh, it will still be there, but it won't be one part of the team. So going back to the presentation, I'm, I bet it's gonna reset, let's see. No, it didn't, excellent. <laughs> so, there we are. Um, is this making sense, by the way? Yeah, good. There's, there's at least one nod. You got my back, Marno. <laughs> so that's good. So it turns out there's no safety check when uh, GitHub, well, when, if you upload your, you push your commits uh, to GitHub, there's no safety check that the SSH key that you're pushing with uh, actually is the, the, any kind of match to your user on the GitHub account. So if I wrote another name and email address, I could easily forge a commit like that. And in GitHub, it would be that person's profile uh, image if, he, if, if he's known, her, known, her is known, she is known. Um, so it would look like them and their name would be right on the Git, on the commit. So that's a kind of, well, it's not really a, like a security breach, but it's confusing and it could, could be leveraged, I guess, for malicious purposes. Yeah, that's the point I was making. <laughs> so, and there it is, and that one. We tested it on Git uh, Enterprise, GitHub Enterprise. So, um, well, uh, there are some issues about this on the internet you can go and find and read about. So, it's, uh, it's, it's a real thing. But then uh, we can also, with the GitHub Enterprise, you can f enforce signed commits and branch protection. So it's, you're not allowed to commit directly to the main branch. And also you have to sign all the commits. So if you try to push a unsigned commit, it will just say no way. This makes it a little harder because you can't go in, in the web UI and just merge things. You have to pull it down and merge it locally because that uh, commit also have to be signed, of course. Uh, and again, every team member, public keys, shared, signing. How many of these are there? There we go. Yeah, that's the last point there. Minor inconvenience. Well, it's not a big deal and you should also uh, not just merge things quickly. So you should really pay attention to what you're doing and download it and actually check where, where all the things are, are changed. So, and one point is, yeah, once you set this up, you don't have to think about it because it, Git will just sign it for you and you, as a user, you're just doing the exact same commit as before. There is a, a parameter like dash big S where you can, uh, capital S, where you can force it to sign a single commit, but you can also use that uh, setup uh, in the configuration that it should always commit. I mean, always sign the commit. So that's nothing you have to think about. 
So enforcing this on the server side, unfortunately, the, or, the ordinary GitHub will not uh, have uh, the enforcement. Uh, it's only enterprise and pro team plans that have that. GitLab does it right, so everything can be signed. You can force signing. And uh, I also checked Giddy. I don't know, Git-T. I don't know if anyone uses that. But uh, it will also do the same uh, signing, like force the signing to be possible. So that's good, right? Um, but I guess you could, even if you you just have an ordinary GitHub account, you can you can make it like a list of those public keys, like I showed before, and and you can have the the build process break if there's uh, unsigned commits or there are commits that don't belong there because the, because the uh, uh, public key is not in the list. So I haven't actually tried that, but uh, I guess it should be an easy scripting problem to solve. Uh, and possibly there is already GitHub actions that can do this for you. Uh, there are a lot of those I uh, see around the world. There we have the pros and the cons. Uh, GPG has a reputation of not being very user friendly, but it's like any other CLI. Once you start using it, it I, I think it works great. It's uh, it's quite okay, <laughs> but it's got some bad rep, so some, some people don't like it. I was at a talk yesterday, uh, he was talking about git sign, which is uh, another one, another way to, to uh, sign your git commits with using eph ephemeral keys, and you don't really have the key locally either, so you're just generating the key through a, a process, so that looked good and, and cool, but there was the, in, the login issue, you have to like log in to generate new keys and stuff like that. So it's, uh, there's some give and take, some, some, uh, some good and some bad about that as well, I guess. But um, yeah, other things is like, it's a little more work to complete a PR because you have to download and merge locally. Uh, key management, still the weakest link because if your computer gets stolen or broken into and all your keys are in the slash SSH directory, then well, that's a problem. Uh, you still have no guarantee that a commit is legit. I set up that as a, with a question mark because while there's, there are no guarantees in software, um, you can be pretty sure that it's legit, but, well, there's always something. And you still don't know the code is bug-free, of course, so there's that. But on the other hand, this will, uh, you can't really fake the commits anymore because once you, have, you, once you demand signing of, of them and once you have a list of, of people you trust within your team and you do that, well, I don't see how that could uh, be faked then because it would show up that you're trying to be someone you're not. Um, all of this is, of course, completely free and open source and transparent, so works pretty well, I think. Never, we never had any issues with it, and we used it quite extensively. So, well, that's that. So I included at the end here uh, a little bit more about the advanced key usage, because uh, if you're really serious about this, you'll make your master key and you'll write it on paper and you'll lock it in a safe and you'll just generate sub keys for different usages for code signing, for email, for uh, disk encryption and they can all be linked to your main key. So that's uh, hardening it even better. Uh, yeah, and disarming or locking your master keys, you, dis you disarm it so that it doesn't, com uh, doesn't um, contain the private key anymore. So, so even if someone stole your computer, they couldn't get your master private key. Um, you can also create revocation certificates. I'm not sure how you would uh, uh, distribute those, but possibly within your team, that's doable if you have a, if you can just, uh, you can commit it to your Git repo, I guess. And then there's the, the moving of uh, your GPG installation. You can take everything with you, of course, move to a new computer. So. That's also a little more uh, advanced topic. I'm not, I don't have time for that, uh, to, to go into that now. Um, and then it's when you start using this and you start using it and you're, for a while you've been using it and then you realize that no, 
we have to stop and we have to go back. So you may have to rethink the solution once you really understand how it works. So, but, but it should be possible to then just remove the keys that you already had and generate new ones and do it like right. Instead of having the one key, you're making, then you're making a master key, and you're making a sub key for, for signing the Git uh, commits in that project and that project and that project, and you can go on and on. It's like so many keys. <laughs> How many keys do you want? Um, and also the, the, the issue of offline key safety, you can, it's one thing to keep it private, but the other, other thing is if you drop your computer and it, the hard, di hard disk di uh, dies, then you have uh, to, through no fault of your own, you don't have the private key anymore. There have been some Bitcoin wallets, I think, that have had some issues around that. <laughs> People searching the junkyard for lost hard drives. Well. Um, I think uh, using like a vault um, tool like HashiCorp Vault or Azure Key Vault or something like that, that should take care of that. You can store keys in there and they're pretty safe. So like if that's not safe enough, then you can of course integrate a hardware security module like an HSM and really go to town on that. But I guess that really is so secure that we have so many other problems to solve that that's okay. So that's, um, I want to do some uh, Q&A on the end here. So that's all I had time for. Uh, thank you for listening. If there are any questions, we can take those now. And uh, if you want to reach out on me, to me, it's also the email address at the front. But I'm on Twitter, my last name on Twitter. And I'm, I'm a Signal user. I don't know if you use Signal. It's a great uh, messaging app. I made a group there, so if you scan that QR code, you should pop right into the group. It's like a lobby where I can like, vet people and take them uh, further into my uh, domain of uh, people I know. I have to verify identity, right? Trust, but verify. So, any comments? Yes, in the back. Oh yes, uh, the question is how, 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 can I, how, how does it really work with Git? Um, it's, uh, Git has already support for GPG. You can, there's a uh, configuration command you, you write and just say this is the program. Point to the program, GPG and Git understand each other, so it just uses it. And then you, you also add the key that you, you want to sign uh, that particular repo with in the config, so it will use that. So it's pretty easy to set up and pretty transparent. Good. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Marno. Yes, yeah, so you mentioned that you um, started looking at this for one of your clients because they had this high throughput and uh, lots of people coming in and coming out. Um, what was their experience with this? Was it useful for them and how did they manage kind of the throughput of Yeah, so the question is, uh, with the team that we were on and the, the throughput of people coming in and leaving the, the team, how, do, how did they manage that? Yes, um, I, I think it was like someone had an idea, we should sign commits, and then they threw it over to us. And we said, okay, we can do it like this. And they said, okay, good, let's go, let's move. <laughs> so the, they had, um, the, everything was done in, in Microsoft Azure, so the Active Directory identity uh, thing was not connected to this, but, but people coming and leaving were controlled by their access to the Azure. So uh, when we are signing commits as well, then we are like doubling up on, on the security. So I guess they thought it just a good thing to do. That answers your question? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Anyone else? Can't really see. There are no, no questions. Okay then. Then I think we're done with six minutes to go. Thank you. <laughs>